I never get used to that countdown. <laughs> Pumps me up every time. Um, so we're live. Welcome, Loish. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for coming on doing this live stream. So Loish is going to be, I'm sure most people know it, know Loish already. They, they know who you are. And you got what, like, what are you at now? A million something on Instagram? Um, I'm at 2.3. 2. 2. Oh, million. Jesus Christ. Wow. I don't you break too much though. It doesn't, I mean. You went from one to two pretty quickly then, huh? Oh, yeah. It's been like a slow growth over time. Um, okay. But you Jeez. know, yeah. It doesn't mean that I actually have 2.3 million people actually seeing. Oh, I know. Posts, but I, yeah. ha I have a similar amount on YouTube and that doesn't mean that <laughs> they watch my yeah. videos. The algorithm. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, congratulations for all your success. And uh, if people don't know who uh, you are, Loish does these amazing stylized um, drawing, mostly digital, right? Uh, yeah, mostly digital. Most, yeah, yeah a digital art. And um, if, if you don't, go, go to her Instagram. It's just um, awesome art. And she's going to be answering a bunch of your questions um, that you posted in the community the, on proco.com. So if you there's still time to ask a question right now. So if you want, go to proco.com slash Loish Live. There's a link right there. Um, and also, uh, Loish has a book that is coming out soon. Is it still, is there still a Kickstarter going on? For yeah, it? it's yeah, still okay. in Kickstarter. We're in like the last six, no, five days, I believe. So we're counting cool. down to the finish. Um, nice. Yeah. I'm sure it's already funded, right? Oh uh, yeah, it's fully yeah. funded. <laughs> like like but, first day. Yeah, but the thing is that um, the Kickstarter edition of the book, uh, it comes with like all this extra stuff. So in the we've uh -huh. done two um, two books through Kickstarter previously, and basically like when you get the Kickstarter di Kickstarter edition, you get it in a special mailing carton. You get all the stre stretch goal goodies to go with it. Mm -hmm. So you get like this unique package. And the last two times we did it, um, you know when. The book was officially released and you could buy it through like amazon or other web shops people would just get the normal version of the book through the web shops and then they would still they were like where are all of the extra goodies and where's the special mailing carton and that was like only through the kickstarter so that's why right. i always try to get the word out as much as possible that mm -hmm. the kickstarter is still on because i don't want anybody like feeling like they yeah. missed the chance yeah good cool so tell us about the book what is it um, so the book is called The Style of Loish. Um, so my first cool. book is called The Art of Loish. It's like my first art book. And then there was the sketchbook, which is more like yeah, rough art. And for my third book, I really wanted it to be about um, my style. Is everything okay? Yeah, no, I, said, I, I think I have your first book. I was just trying to find oh, okay. it. I have my I, first book too. <laughs> I, <I'm sure. laughs> awesome. Um. But yeah, so for the third book, like, so the thing that I, I really found out that I love doing um, a lot since I released the first book is like uh, giving tips and advice that are like not only technical tips, but also kind of like mindset tips. And I, I have like a secret passion for self-help books. So I just love stuff <laughs> that like helps yeah. me with the mentality, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I've been thinking about a way to get my third book to have that kind of angle to it. I've been thinking about it for years. And uh, last year we landed on the concept of style of Loish to make it about kind of how I developed my style, but also to address the issue of like, how do you find your own style? And what are ways that you can like search for it? What are exercises that you can do to help you cultivate your own voice? So the art book, you know, it has a lot of my art in it and like tips and techniques, but most importantly, it has like suggestions and inspiration for the artist who's reading it to think about their own style and how they can mm -hmm. kind of cultivate it and allow it to grow. Cool. Awesome. And what, uh, where do they go to the, get the support the Kickstarter? I mean, yeah. So, um, it's kind of like a long URL. I don't think I should like list it. Um, yeah, but... let me, let me make sure it's on the page. Yeah, it is. Okay. So if you guys go to proco.com slash lowish live, the link that's right there, um, click on lesson notes and there is a link in the lesson notes that takes you to the Kickstarter. Um, and also ask a question. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you know, yeah, scroll through. Let's, let's see. Some of them. That's cool. Yeah. So that's like some of the stuff about the book. So you can kind of head over there and see some previews and mm -hmm. some more explanation. Cause it is like, we did struggle a little bit with the concept of trying to get it like, you know, to be a mixture of like, my art 
but then also have like exercises and tips in it. So it's not like purely right. instructional, but it's also not purely an art book either. It's somewhere. In yeah. yeah. So the, it's like, I think it's better explained on the page and there's also like a video and everything. So definitely check it out. Awesome. And the stretch goals. So if you buy the book on Kickstarter, you get a free bookmark, you get free stickers. Uh, if we reach the last uh, stretch goal, you get a card set. So there's all these like fun little goodies that you get with it for free. Nice. What's the what's the highest tier? <laughs> that's <like. laughs> so that's another thing. Okay, so like you know, in the previous Kickstarters, we had like a bunch of tiers, right? And oh, and have, there's only two. There's only two, like, right? Oh. So that's the thing. Like, if you have like, for example, five different things you want to offer, like a print, and like in this case, we're offering like a slip case, a print, an exercise booklet with some ideas and and. Um, sketchbook pages that you can sketch in um, you get like a bunch of tiers right with like combinations of each one and it gets really complex so this kickstarter is just two tiers you've got the signed book and the unsigned book so and the signed copies are sadly sold out so you can only get the book but then once you click on that it takes you to the second page and there you can choose your add-ons yeah, so okay. from a drop down menu so you can say like okay with my book i also want this this and this but it's like on the next page so that's also a good thing to point out. Got it. Looks like you're going to have to do 3,300 signed books. I almost did the majority <laughs> of the signatures, actually. But you've I already spent the last them. couple of weeks just signing pages. I, <laughs> I've, I've always wondered how long that takes. So, like, how many, how many hours does it take to do 3,300 signatures? I calculated it. Um, well, the thing is, yeah. like, we have, um, so <laughs> we have the pages. Yeah. And they are getting uh, binded into the book, or like oh uh, right, the book. right. So, so that you I'm just signing... send all the signatures to the yeah. I send like all yeah, of the signed sense. pages over to the printer, and they like put it in in the book. So it becomes a page in the book, but I'm not literally holding the book and signing it. That'd be way but too because expensive. Because of that, I can work ship really fast. You, ship it to them, then ship it to the yeah. customer. <laughs> it's just it's kind of crazy. Yeah. But otherwise, it would they would have to ship like three thousand books to my house. I don't know if there's even yeah. room in my house to hold all, yeah. the, all those books. So, um, and I calculated that it is about like eight hours in total of signing, Okay. like nonstop. But if I break that down into like, you know, I put on a good podcast Yeah. And I just. Yeah. Good thing nice. you didn't do like a, I'll draw a picture in your book sort of thing. Cause that <laughs> people do that and then they get stuck for months doing drawings and yeah. books. That happened to uh, a good friend of mine. She had like yeah. an, an early, it's Iris Compete. She had like an, an mm -hmm. early bird. Like if you bought her book in the first 48 hours, you got a free sketch with it and it turned out to be like <laughs> like six months of hundreds. work. Or, yeah. <laughs> and basically people are paying like $10 for a free drawing and she has all this work. Yeah. It's but funny. she did, her book did really well. So yeah. Cool. But that was hard work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, let, let's start the demo. Um, you, you know, th this is pre-recorded. You did a pretty good. Cool so tell us what you're going to be, what they're going to see in this demo. And then right, we'll get so to this, questions. Yeah. So this demo is, um, there are two stylization studies that I'm going to do. So I did them in Procreate on the iPad. I usually work in Photoshop, um, but I, I have noticed that a lot of people use Procreate. And this tends to, yeah. you know, a lot of people have questions about my process in Procreate. So I figured this is a good way to show my process there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm going to do is basically like get my reference image. It's from Graphics Studio on Cubebrush. So they're like, they have really good uh, expression packs and pose packs and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to use this as a jumping off point. So that's something that I think I find quite interesting is like taking a reference image and using it as a starting point um, for like your own interpretation. Um, so I, that's always helped me a lot to kind of discover my style and figure out what kind of stylization techniques work well for me is by allowing myself to depart from the reference image. So to use the reference image for some aspect, but also know when to move away from it again. Right. right. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing here. And then I'm going to be doing two different treatments. So one of them is going to be more angular, more geometric type of treatment in the sketch and in the rendering. And then the second one is going to be more like soft and round. Uh -huh. And what I think is interesting about that is how if you kind of start out with that mindset of like, okay, this one's going to be more angular, that how that informs 
many of the creative choices as you go, right? So it informs how you sketch and how you construct the shapes, but also like the color choices, the rendering, the, um, you know, the brush that, that works best as well. So that's what we're gonna see in this demo, like kind of how using these two different techniques kind of creates two different end results. Cool. Yeah, so I'm sure people want to hear about you know, like some comments on the demo as it's playing. Um, I'm going to start questions, but if you know at any point you want to comment on the demo, just just like pause yeah. and, and do that at any moment whenever you feel like it. Yes. All right. So the first question is uh, from Femka Debora. I don't know. Uh, it says, "Hi, Lois. I have a question for you. How do you usually come up with?" ideas to start sketching. I have the problem that I don't have a clear idea in my mind and I can't figure out a good pose. So usually I'll search for reference picks, but I want to do some more creative poses or just something that isn't copied. I feel like when I can only depend on references, I'm not creative enough. I think this is a perfect question for what you're doing here. Yeah. It's like using reference, but still being creative. So. Yeah. I think that's a common issue, right? Especially if you're like drawing quite often that that you kind of at the beginning of your drawing session kind of blank out and you're not sure what to do i don't know if you ever have that when you're drawing from reference or no, when you're drawing like yeah just in general when you're like i'm not sure what to draw and then you grab your reference and you don't know whether you're going to stick closely to it or whether you're going to move away from it um i'm or you're more more of a technical artist when i'm more traditional stuff. so if i'm drawing from reference i'm sticking pretty close to it i'm making more this my stylized decisions aren't as uh far from the reference as yours um they're more of subtle and like subtle improvements to shapes and edges and more about clarity of form yeah. clarity of of um shape and that sort of thing but it's it's more it's like it's a subtle stylization but still keeping it realistic so um yeah not really <laughs> so what i what because that's the thing like you said that it's a lot about like capturing the form right and that's your focus so that's for me like what really helps me to kind of figure out what i'm going to draw is to choose an area of focus before i get started so to say like okay i'm i'm going to make some studies of expressions or whatever but then making a really clear choice in advance of like, what is it that I'm trying to capture about this? So mm -hmm. am I trying to capture volumes? Then that's my focus. Or am I trying to capture, you know, exaggeration? Like if, if you're more like an animation type artist, then you might want to like push those expressions further. So then exaggeration becomes your focus and your kind of creative choices fall around that. And I think having an area of focus before you get started kind of guides the creative process. And it also leads to you know having like learning more from your drawing session because you know what you're trying to amplify and then you also know kind of what you're what you can leave behind right so what's less important um and i think the same counts for if you're like not drawing from reference but you're drawing from the imagination that you kind of decide like okay so what is it that i'm trying to capture here like and make it attainable um so even something like, okay, I'm going to draw an in ink today and I'm going to try to get better at inking or I'm going to capture flowy and dynamic poses. But like once you've made that choice, you know what you're going to focus on and then you can kind of make choices around how much you want to stay close to the reference or how much you want to move away from it, depending on what that focus is. So I'm a big believer in sort of doing focused studies as a way of improving. Um, and that's also one of the things that's... Yeah. Um, in my art book and in the exercise book that you can get with it, it has a lot of exercise suggestions for this sort of stuff, like basically deciding in advance or like drawing the same thing three times and being like, okay, the first one's going to focus on movement. Second one's going to focus on volume. And then with each one, you'll, you'll learn something new. So I think that that helps. I think that that's, that's basically my guide when it comes to, if I'm not sure what I want to draw. Um, and if I'm like totally blanked out, then I'll just basically say like, all right, I'm going to get some reference and I'm going to, sort of just choose an area of focus that I think could use some improvement at this point. And I usually just take that day by day, like just decide right before my drawing session. Yeah, I definitely agree with the focused studies aspect of it. I mean, even if I'm doing a, like I'm trying to go for a realistic render of something, 
I'll still do several studies beforehand, focusing in on one aspect of it. Yeah. Like I'm just going to study the shapes and like the, the composition and I'll simplify just the shapes and don't worry about anything else. And, or I'll focus on the gesture and try to find where is the flow in this and then yes. focus, focus on the anatomy and just like dissect it, draw the bones, draw the muscles. So you can still like really study your reference and be really focused. And then once you get to the final, you know, so you're so much more familiar with what it is you're drawing that you yeah. can make better decisions and how you're going to change it because you know what it is. Yeah, and maybe yeah. also through those sort of study sessions, you kind of connected with like what fascinates me the most about this. Right. Because I think that that's the thing. That's where you'll kind of click with your your sort of innate talent is if you know like what clicks with you. Like when you when you draw it and you're like, this fascinates me. This is interesting. This holds my attention. That's something you can like really build on. Mm -hmm. um, whereas some things, I think there's you can't capture everything, and I think there's a lot of like stuff you could focus on in a reference image that you don't find interesting and it'll make the process really laborious and, and boring to draw that. Right. So then yeah. you learn something about yourself, like what, what you like and what fascinates you and what's less interesting to you. Yeah. Cool. So uh, next one's from jo Javar draws, uh, says, hi Lois, I'm a super fan. Can you give some advice about stylization? So it's pretty broad, but I figured it's very, <laughs> tailored to your book so yeah. why not you could pretty much say whatever you want about style <laughs> yeah um geez I think this demo is also a good good sort of like example of what I would give as advice about stylization um I say like try to try to depart from your reference image one thing that I've always found useful is like for example this is like an exercise idea that I've tried a few times that I think works really well is to kind of study something. So draw it from reference, for example, a type of animal you've never drawn before, or like a face or a pose, draw it, draw it from reference and kind of study it for a bit and then put that aside and then draw the same thing from memory, like oh, within yeah. the same drawing session. And then you'll have to make some hard choices, right? And like, what do you keep and what have you since forgotten, right? And you might have to come up with some creative solutions to try and capture the same thing again from memory. But that will kind of like allow you to like kind of force you to stylize the same subject matter and see what you fall back on. You know, you'll probably fall back on more simple shapes and maybe like, you know, different approach like maybe you're thinking of the movement instead of like the details of how something looks I think that that's a really good example of like how you're you force your brain to stylize so I think doing that exercise can teach you a lot about how stylization like the relationship that you have to source material because you always need some kind of reference I think and then how you kind of depart from that and use your imagination and use like your creative thinking to solve other problems which is how you that's where the stylization comes in and that's where unique right. style comes in, right? Because everyone would do that differently. Right. The stuff you forgot, you have to kind of fill in those gaps with yeah. your own ideas. Yeah, it's funny. That that exercise is actually really good for even if you are you don't want to draw from imagination, you're more just purely like reference-driven classical artist. Um, it's a good idea to do that because it, um, it trains you to remember only the important things. So it, it trains you to identify what's important. Because yeah. if you only have a little bit of time to like, if you're looking at a drawing, you say, I have a minute to just kind of look and remember it. And then you put it away and try to draw it. It forces you to identify those important things that even if you had the reference in front of you the whole time, you still need to identify those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And stylization is all about, I think, making choices, like yeah. saying like, oh, this is the one thing I'm going to push mm -hmm. and then I'm going to leave something else behind. And, and that's also like, a fundamental part of artistic style. Like when I look at artists that inspire me who have unique styles, they've all chosen to like kind of focus on something as their sort of trademark. And they build on that and kind of grow their skill in that area. And then other things kind of gradually get left behind. But in that process of making choices, that's where you find your own voice and your own style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Okay, uh, this comes from a deal uh which master illustrators and artists would you recommend studying from hmm. does master mean like like a classical artist or is that could that be no. anyone i would consider you a master like 
I, yeah, no. no. Well, yeah, <laughs> people study your stuff as master studies all the time. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, it, it could. It doesn't have to be someone who's old. <laughs> it doesn't have to be someone who's dead. Um, it okay, doesn't okay. have to be any specific style. It's just somebody who's probably. I would say a professional who has figured out how to do this <laughs> that someone okay. can learn from by copying them or studying their work yeah That's okay um yeah i think i mean i think it depends entirely so like i think that if you have an artist you love study them um, and that will be different for everyone, right? So I don't think there's like certain kind of art that's like more worthwhile to study than right. others. Um, so it's like, if you have your own set of favorite artists, um, learn from that and kind of integrate it into what you do, like take the lessons you learn from their art and bring it into your own art, right? Because that's, that's how you find your own voice. Um, like my style very much emerged from blending, um, like all of my influences at that time in my life into one, which was like a really weird mix of things. It was like yeah. random anime and manga stuff I found on the internet that I didn't even know where it was from. Um, the Powerpuff Girls, uh, Star Wars, like I just mixed it all together and it created a weird mix and, and out of that came my style. So I right. think anything you like could be a good source to study. Um, and right now, like the artists that I, love the most um i'm a big fan of like I've, I've always mentioned this artist but like i'm a big fan of andrew hem who does like oil paintings that are like autobiographical and it, it incorporate elements of his life but they're also like very dense and have like a fantasy element and some stylization but like really unique use of color so that's oh, yeah, this is cool this is an artist yeah. that's always inspired me enormously and for me is like kind of you know I, I really aspire to one day have the kind of artistic practice that he does, like doing mm -hmm. sketches and studies and then kind of in, implementing that into a series of completely unique art. Um, yeah. And I also love um, right now, like uh, Yun Ling is an artist who makes like kind of a series of digital paintings with like a character that's sort of walking through this world and uses kind of lighting that is super realistic, but at the same time, very stylized. Um, mm -hmm. so that's oh, stuff yeah. that I'm looking at a lot right now. Very but cut I, out shapes, right? Like sharp yeah. edges everywhere. Yeah, this is cool. I love it. Yeah. And um, Snaddy89. Oh, yeah. Wait, is she, sorry, is Yun, is Yun Ling, is she a concept artist or is this more of like her every piece is just kind of a vision or i think it's like their own personal work but i i'm okay. not sure what they do i just have them on twitter and every time they post something i'm like oh my god like i could stare at it for hours and yeah so lately so i've been cool. really inspired by art that kind of like has this really good um integration of the character with the setting mm -hmm. like that's what both andrew ham and yun ling do incredibly well um, and that's where I'm at right now. I'm trying, cause I've been a character artist for a really long time, just drawing mostly characters against, you know, just like a simple background. And lately I've been wanting to put my characters in a world more. And that isn't, you know, something that I, that's not my strength. So I'm really trying to learn from these artists who do that really well. Yeah, they're, they're both very good at composition. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm creating something unique. I think it's, it's very unique what they put down the world that they create. Like you just want to be in it, you know? Right. Yeah, it's like a complete vision. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, those are good suggestions. Thank you. Um, maybe comment on the uh, on the demo while I search for the next question. Yeah. So right now at the demo, we've reached a point where I've done like the two sketches. So I have for both of them kind of like a rough under sketch, and then like a more defined sketch on top. So that in my workflow, it helps me a lot to start very um, rough and very light and then to kind of build the detail gradually on top, mainly because, you know, the more detailed the work gets, the more anxiety comes in about like, is this the right kind of detail? And like yesterday I was on TikTok and I was looking at this artist who was drawing like straight, kind of like Kim Young Gi does, like just mm -hmm. straight onto the canvas, like really confident lines. I don't understand how people could do that. So I need a very, very light under sketch and I need to get those basic shapes down. And then I'll be doing my more detailed sketch on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then 
once I have that, I will merge those two together, this lighter sketch and the darker sketch, because I want to keep all of the sketch lines. And then I'll start blocking in the color underneath. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm kind of like taking, um, you know, blocking the silhouette in underneath those sketch lines. Cool. So, okay. So I got a question. Um, wait, which one was it? This one. At what point should you start learning how to stylize? been drawing for a year and I don't consider myself to have a style yet. I have heard that it develops over time from who your inspirations are, if I study what they do, but is there any more than that? Yeah, so I actually um, I'm one of those people who says style develops naturally. And um, I once read a quote somewhere that was, you don't find your style, it finds you. And I, I definitely agree with that. Like, I think that a lot of people who say, I don't know what my style is, or I don't have a style, they actually do. And they're cultivating it already, but they just don't see it yet. Cause they're not, they haven't reached that point yet where they can identify what sets them apart from other artists. Especially if you're starting out, it's very hard to tell what sets you apart from other artists because you're still channeling a lot of your influences and you might not have gotten enough feedback really to contextualize what you do. And you, the skill isn't even there to execute on your style properly. Yeah, you got to learn, like, the priorities are there, right? Because style comes a lot from your priorities. Like, you kind of decide, what is it that I want to say with my art? And then, can, are you capable of doing that yet? And over time, your skills will get better at kind of conveying what you want to convey. Um, and I think the, you know, as you continue to work on your style or channel your inspirations, I think it comes naturally. You you will your style will find you. But I can understand, like, especially nowadays, people just want to find their style sooner. Like, they want to yeah. know. And and especially, like, we all, you know, we're... I'm going to be, like, an old lady, uh, old lady mode. When I was <laughs> starting out, we didn't have social media, you know? So there was no need. To that wasn't have... that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, it was like 15 years ago, right? For us, it wasn't. But there's going to be, there's gonna be right. somebody in the YouTube chat who said, I was born that year. Oh, so. yeah. I was born in 2004. <laughs> right. so, um, so <laughs> yeah. I'm also seeing, I'm watching the YouTube comments come by. So it's, it's a lot of fun seeing them. So shout out to the YouTube commenters. Anyway, um, so when I was starting out, there was no need to like have a style early on. You're just like having fun. Right. And posting stuff for just for fun. Like, yeah, you didn't think anybody would see it. At least that was the case for me. And nowadays, like you people are already thinking about their future and about how they're going to brand their art when they're like not even out of high school yet. And yep. and I think a lot of people feel the pressure to have that personal brand. Um, oh, see, somebody said I was born in 2004. I told you that was going <laughs> to happen. Are you following the is it, are you following yeah. the YouTube? Line? Yeah, okay. Yeah. OK, I'm looking at the. <laughs> questions page so i don't see that but yeah oh anyway. well, cool. well of course someone's born <laughs> of course <I> mean. <laughs> always um yeah but yeah i think that because because we have social media now people want to find that style a lot quicker and they want to pressure themselves into having that because it's part of um being on social media because social media is a form of branding you want to find your brand right yeah um so i don't think that that's a good idea i think it's good to like allow yourself to keep exploring and learning and to allow your style to grow out of that yeah. Um, but if you're somebody who is like, oh, well, I have to have my style or I want to find it or it's, it's my ambition to, um, again, my art book has a bunch of exercises in there that are super focused on like trying out different things and then asking yourself what clicked with me, like what felt right to me, what excited me and what inspired me. And so if you try out a bunch of stuff and, and then you do that kind of self-reflection on what what works for you and then you kind of gravitate more towards those things then you can find your style then you can find out you know what clicks with your brain and and that's what will sort of inform your future creative decisions yeah so this uh, um this question kind of shows a little bit of that attitude of like maybe rushing too much so um i'll read it just in case there's an, other comments related to it but um how can I improve my skills faster to, <laughs> to draw stylized characters? Because it feels like it needs a lot of time to learn about anatomy and mastering it to draw anything you want for imagination. 
I really envy my classmates in art school who draw all sorts of stylized portraits and wonder how they do it. I wonder if there's an easy or faster way for me to execute the stuff I want to do, not just learn and feel stuck. Yeah. So um, that's one so. of those situations where like, I would say, um, like do take the time to learn, like be patient with your art, you know? Um, because for me, especially while writing the book, so the book talks a lot about how I found my style over time, which is something that I didn't consciously decide, you know, as I was learning how to draw. I didn't say like, okay, I want my to find my style. I was just kind of drawing and then by coincidence, I would stumble across things. So I would be like, um, you know, trying out a random tutorial for fun. And then I'd be like, oh, this, wow, this really works for me. And that would become foundational to my style, but it was like, not under pressure and not under stress. It was just playing around for the sake of it. And today as well, I was just drawing in my sketchbook in ink and my brush pen was dry and like dying out, but I was too lazy to get up. And so I just used the dry brush pen and I yeah. found a new technique for drawing hair with it. And I was like, this really works for my style, you know? And it's like, it's in those kind of like unguarded moments of experimenting that you find the building blocks um, but I guess you can accelerate it if you do the focused study kind of stuff that I was talking about earlier. So if you say like, oh, I really want to learn how to capture volumes more clearly, and then you focus heavily on that and you push that into kind of like a learning moment for yourself. Yeah, then you can learn a lot of skills quickly. But I also think that if you're looking at your classmates art and saying like, oh, they're doing really great stylized portraits and they're really good and I wanna be just as good as them, but really quickly, I think you might also have a problem with comparing yourself to other people. Like maybe you're one of those people who always looks at other people's art and is like, they're a lot better than me. I wanna be as good as them. And you may be completely overlooking sort of your own strengths and your own abilities that you don't see and you're, you're better at identifying other people's skills and seeing your own strengths. And that's another sort of like going to be a roadblock in the way of finding your own voice. Yeah. And then you, you tend to kind of cling on to other people's successes and say, oh, they're getting attention because they're doing this thing really well. And then you start trying to do that, too, um, just to kind of follow in the success of somebody else. And that might not work for for you right yeah. it works for that person it's, it's kind of like a fomo type of um problem right like you, you, yeah. it's a it's a it's a similar situation where it is and and also if you think that way if you're like oh they're doing it better than i am then you know you tend to overestimate other people people who do that which is like i've been there i've been that person everybody i think everybody career. does it so that i'm speaking from personal yeah. experience but then you may be overestimating other people's success and and um you know you may be thinking like well that person has like such a great style and i want to have a great style too but then that person meanwhile is struggling with their own style in their own yeah. way right so right. they're looking at someone like, else and being like oh i wish i was like yeah. them <laughs> yeah yeah exactly like as soon as you think that way you're kind of like blocking the ability to you know just connect with what works for you. Um, and I think for me, my career has been like a long process of accepting that, you know, what works for me uh, is what works for me. And I, there are certain things that I'll never be good at and that's okay. Like I don't aspire to be the best artist at everything. I, I just try to do what I do um, as well as I can. You know, and that's I think every artist out there is doing that. And honestly, that's a lesson that I learned so much from being a concept artist, because I would come to these different studios and I would see artists of all different skill levels being part of the team. So there would be like a really talented and successful artist at a super specific thing, only doing that super specific thing in the concept art team. And there would be like total beginners who are just like learning how certain things worked and had like a relatively low skill level, but they were like really good at communication and really good at like getting ideas going. And I've seen all different skill levels of artists in, in different areas of my work. And I learned that it's, it's not about being the best. It's about just doing your part as well as you can. So, and when it comes to style, that's allowed me to accept my own style more as well. And I think that any artist who has this tendency to say like somebody else's style is better has, a risk of 
having that black and white attitude that that won't allow you to see how everybody does their own thing the best that they can. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, and you don't have to answer it. Uh, why are most of the images dominated by perky females? Is it the market or your choice? And she <laughs> said, or he or she says, your work is beautiful, reflection of your skill. So they oh. think they, they like it. They're just wondering. <laughs> it's just the market. I saw that it was popular and I decided to do that. <laughs> okay. What, what, no, uh, what no, were you it's my, no, it's my choice. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> what were you doing before that? Uh, <laughs> That's I secretly, funny. I secretly only I draw um, dragons and fantasy art. No, I'm kidding. I um, I no, I've always wanted to draw female characters, uh, because I, you know, my influences are like that. Like my main influence is Alphonse Mucha and uh, Arden Vaux. and that's like cool. you know female like these these feminine pinups that inspired me, and I just started by copying that stuff. And Disney princesses are a huge inspiration to me. Um. So when I was first learning how to draw, I just focused on those type of characters, just loved conveying. I think I also just, it was a form of self-expression because I was very um, like, very cynical and jaded negative teenager, just like a cliche, like goth type. Um, and I discovered like all this colorful and joyful art on the internet. And so I started kind of putting my sort of desire for that kind of colorful joyfulness and like just a kind of free uh, something something just cute and happy I started putting that into my art so it was sort of like a way for me to find an outlet for that and that kind of took on a life of its own so it's for in that sense it was always just very like natural it felt natural to me um I did get a lot of criticism for that uh for a really long time from my teachers and from people on the internet, just that anybody was always like, oh, you you only draw women. But by now I feel like that's become less of a problem. Like when I was drawing like in the early 2000s, this was like kind of weird to only draw female characters or like- but Why was it weird? I don't get it. What's the problem there? <laughs> um, you know, because people assume that if you wanted to be like a professional artist that you needed to have like more range, right? Which uh, is like, I can yeah. draw a variety of characters and I can draw in different styles. I have to, but I just don't like gravitate towards that as much. But I think now you have so much, so many like games and movies with interesting female characters. And that's where I get most of my sort of paid work now. And that was less of a thing in like 2007, 2006, when I was in school. Um, there were like, if you only drew female characters or feminine things, you would end up kind of, I guess, in toys which I have done work for toys as well, but like not as much in like games or in the more serious kind of media. And I think nowadays there's more variety there. So there's also a lot of like discussion in the game industry of like whether the female characters that existed for a long time are like a good representation of women, which it wasn't a thing for a long time. I, I think that that's, it's kind of hard to explain because it's, it's such a long time ago, but like there was kind of like a wave of feminism on the internet in like 2012 or something that changed mm -hmm. a lot, changed a lot and like changed people's views of people who draw feminine art. But before that, it was real, just seen as embarrassing. And my teachers made a lot of fun of me. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's a, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different career paths. It's like, yeah, were they, were they thinking that, or were you, trying to be like a concept artist or specifically like work in the entertainment industry because like it, there's room for somebody who's super focused in the subject matter in like fine art or whatever um like was there yeah. a specific career path that they gave you and they thought you had to fit into that well i was studying animation so i don't know if they were basing okay. it on that um, but okay. I think my well, teachers I just so, wanted yeah. me to, I think they thought it was just really easy. They thought it was like, um, oh, you know, like a kind of a shortcut for mm. everything. I don't know. They, I think they thought okay. it was silly. I, a lot of people think girly art is silly and maybe it is, you know, <laughs> not 2.3 million people. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe people just like, <laughs> you. you know, I, I always just liked colorful, like kind of yeah. innocent art because I just did, you know, so I don't know. There, I think there's a lot of gatekeeping in art. 
I mean, Disney is like probably the biggest brand and a lot of their stuff was, you know, Disney princesses for a very long time. Yes. <laughs> and, I and I love the Disney princesses. Yeah. No, so I what, also, yeah, I worked at a market game for studio. It. I worked at a game studio uh, uh, at a certain point and they were, I was drawing this kind of stylized art and they were like, if we, if we make it look like this, it's going to look like Disney. Why do we want our game to look like Disney? And they were talking about it like it was just like a really dirty word. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, I would play a game that looks like Disney. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that's changed a that's lot. It's, there's a, There's been a sort of evolution in that culture. And also like semi-realism is a very appreciated style now. Whereas yeah. I think 10 years ago it was more, or maybe 15 years ago it was more like, there weren't as many um, types of media that were that were using the semi-realistic style. Cool. Um, do you want me to go to the next question or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, how much do you pre-plan your compositions, colors, poses, etc., before starting a piece? And how much of it is just winging it as you go? If you do a lot of pre-planning, what's your process like in terms of being conscious of values, colors, etc.? Um, so for me, planning too much has a paralyzing effect. Um, so I just, if I, I kind of try to go with the flow as much as I can. And I try to keep the initial stage where I sort of set up the rough version of my drawing. I try to do that as quickly as I can um, to just get the energy going and just work fast and toss everything down. Um, and then I will kind of try to keep that energy in the final render, but I... I will change stuff as I go as well. And sometimes the whole drawing changes. Sometimes I'll change the whole color scheme or like move stuff around. Yeah, I see you doing that all the time in your, like you just now, you were yeah. shifting the shadow from like hot pink to like dark, you know, green. Oh, yeah. Right. It's yeah, like, which right. one is it? Like, you know, you're. <laughs> yeah, that's what I love about um, digital art is like I can just talk, throw down a color and then move the sliders around and change it and then kind of see like, oh, what what's working and what isn't. Um, yeah. For me, that's really important because if I if I try to like stick to a plan in advance, I've done that, but then the end result is just awful. Mm -hmm. I think because the planning, like the desire to set it down and follow through in exactly the right way, it has like a just a crippling effect on my creativity and it gets my stress levels yeah. really high. Yeah, some artists do a really they find that balance perfectly where they do enough planning and they get comfortable with the subject matter just enough to be able to then execute and keep a very alive, spontaneous look to it. But you could, yeah, you could definitely go too far to the planning and just, it just- Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of artists who, there are artists who plan it out really well and get great end results. And it's a balance, I, I truly envy them because it's just yeah. not a skill that I have. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't handle it well. Um, I've noticed that my best work comes out of stuff that's just more loose and spontaneous and um, has the expectations set very low. So when the expectations are high, I'm I just kind of freak out, yeah. um, which counts for much in life, you know, as well for like work and for, you know, giving a talk in front of a group of people and seeing that they expect something from me. Like those are the things I don't handle very well, but then if there's like no expectations, I handle that better. So I think everybody's different in that sense. Cause some people are super motivated by setting high standards for themselves and they, they thrive in those situations, but not me. So I, I try to keep it very loose and very like nothing required of me in my creative process. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I have to mention um, Nikolai Feshin pretty much every video I make. So this is mm -hmm. a good time for it. Um, <laughs> he, he's like one of my favorite artists. And I think he's got that great balance where when you look at his paintings, they look very spontaneous. Like he just just kind of sat down and started throwing paint at the, <laughs> at the canvas. But he did a lot of planning. He would do drawing studies beforehand and they were very detailed. And But then the painting is, it just, it's not dead you know yeah it, it looks like he figured it out on the spot but yeah you know that's that's what it that's the difference really between a master who knows how to execute on the on the vision that was already determined um yeah, yeah and i think also having my... like really good experience like kind of knowing where it will take you you know mm -hmm. um like having a good workflow where you know you have a sense of where the end result will take you because right. i think like for me i never really reached a point where i could say like you know, plan in ahead 
plan ahead like this is how it's going to look and then manage to exactly capture that i don't think i have as much control over my workflow maybe right. one day i'll I don't, get there but. i don't think it's exact it's like plan enough of the enough things and then leave enough for spontaneity yeah um and you just figure out those important things um but anyway that's my that's my fashion shout out because i have to <laughs> <laughs> do you know a fashion nikolai oh okay you how do i spell that uh nikolai n-i-c-o-l-i all right, I think yeah. I've seen it already. <laughs> and then Fashion, F-E-C-H-I-N. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I've seen this before. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah, he's, he's a... Yeah, he, he's, yeah he, a he's got, like, a great mastery of, um, like, having certain parts loose and then knowing exactly where to bring the focus and the finesse mm -hmm. so that you like, take in those details but also can appreciate the roughness of it. It's beautiful. Yeah. And he would just play with textures and like materials all the time too. He's just very exploring, explorative, <laughs> very creative in just his execution as well. So that's why it looks so spontaneous. Yeah. Um, here, maybe comment on your, <laughs> I got to read through a few of these. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah this your, is a good your... time. It's a good time. Okay, um, good. So this is a point where I've kind of, okay, so I had my color and then I added a shadow layer with multiply and kind of like looked for the colors for that to get it to blend well with the layer below. And then I've got like my rough version. And then what I'll do is just merge it all together. So I've got my sketch lines merge with my color layer and my shadow layer, and then I'll just paint on top of it. Um, and what I love about this is I call this part of the technique sculpting with color. So I've got it all together and all that I'm doing really is picking the color off of the canvas and then using that to sort of sculpt out the detail. And what I like about that technique is that I don't have to like switch tools or change my brush. I can just get a brush that works for me and then pick a color and then just use that. Um, so what I'm doing at this stage is, is using the colors that are already there and getting those details refined and, and bringing in that, also, also cleaning up some of the edges, moving stuff around and, and getting that like sort of finalized layer of coloring on top. Cool. Um, I think there's, there's two questions in here. One is kind of career based and another is more technical. Um, what do you think are some key tips to develop a strong dynamic portfolio? And the other one are studies that you do often to improve line quality and color theory. What was the first um, one again? It, it, um, tips to develop a strong dynamic portfolio. Oh yeah. Okay. Strong and dynamic portfolio. Um, that's something that I think depends entirely on the kind of work that you're looking for. Um, so I studied animation and an animation portfolio will be very different from for example, a concept art portfolio or an illustration portfolio. So you definitely have to get the basics from like the field that you're interested in, in working in. Um, but what I've always found to be very useful in assessing somebody's work is to see not only their best work, but to see how they developed that work. Um, so how did you, you know, what, how did you come up with ideas for this piece and like what kind of different variations did you try out? Um, and what's your ideation process and what's your sketching process? Because um, most of the paid work that I've done um, involves like, you know, your client doesn't just want to know um, like what you're capable of in terms of your best work, but they also want to see like, if they throw some ideas at you, what kind of sketches will you come up with? You know, can you make a bunch of variations? Can you push a concept to, you know, beyond your first idea? Like how do you go from your first idea to your final idea and why did you do that? So that's the kind of stuff that I think really belongs in a portfolio, like not just showing your best work. Obviously you should show your best work and show like a variety of different kinds of work that you can do, but also like, how do you think and how do you develop your ideas? Like try to highlight that in your portfolio. Um, and what was the second one? The second one was, I mean, I, I think this person is trying to improve their line quality and color theory. So oh, they're yeah. looking for studies or exercises that you could do to do that. Um, so line quality, well, what I do to try and improve my line quality is inking studies. That that really helps me to get out like just my sketchbook and my inking tools yeah. and just see 
what I can create from that and and digital or traditional traditional okay yeah, yeah. good yeah so I, was... I really dislike drawing line work digitally i know there are a lot of people who do that really well and also prefer the digital tools but for me it's never worked that's why my style like what you can see here in my demo is i go from sketch to color like i skip any kind of line work phase mm -hmm. for some reason i find line work on the computer extremely tedious and um <laughs> frustrating so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i love inking with with pens so that's something that i'll do yeah i agree um, that's probably the best exercise for line quality ink is not as nearly as forgiving like with a pencil you could build up your line quality slowly yeah but with ink you, it's like yeah it's yeah it's, it's challenging you, you gotta, yeah. yeah but it, it drives improvement a lot and it kind of like forces you to make hard decisions sometimes you know um like i usually take it too far uh, like draw too much and then I'm like oh how am I going to make this work and then I have to get really creative with that um, and I learn a lot from that and color theory I think doing color studies and with with eyeballing color is the, is the best way really to learn color and especially like if you're somebody that struggles with like muddy colors to push yourself to use really bright and unconventional colors for the highlights and the shadows that's the type of exercise that I always recommend because it kind of like you know, if you use unconventional shadow and highlight colors, it teaches you so much about how colors interact because it teaches you how, like, how does a base color completely change uh, quality when you set a different color against it, for example. And yeah. um, it kind of forces you to think about color temperature and, and understand how, how these interactions work and how color is relative. Um, and using a reference as a jumping off point is always a great way to kind of like fall back on your reference for believability, but try to push a little bit further to get like vibrancy. I think yeah. it's always a fun exercise to do. Yeah. So in both cases, you're pushing, you're trying to challenge, really push, make it more challenging to drive growth. Cause you know, like with color, if you stick with more meat, like neutral tones, you're probably going to get a decent result with color because everything kind of harmonizes naturally in the middle but if you're trying to push a shadow towards bright green you have there's a you have a problem now of harmonizing that green with the rest of it and you it, you have to figure it out now yeah um, so yeah that challenge is where you grow yeah cool yeah and i always think color is a lot about like i i, I experience color as like an emotional thing it's like it's not really something that is like a fact it's something that you mm -hmm. feel, you know? So if you, if you see like a sunset or something, it's not like you're like, oh, that's a kind of, you know, pinkish hue that I see. No, you're like feeling that warmth, you know, it's like an experience mm -hmm. and a color in general has that. I think color says so much about vividness or about, you know, mood, um, all of that is integrated. And so if you, if you do color studies by eyeballing them and by trying to push them, you're, or you're pushing the emotion that you're feeling when you see that color rather than just seeing that color as a fact. And that's always yeah. helped me the most in understanding colors, like to not think of it in terms of like, this is what it is, but to think of like, this color feels this way to me. How can I capture that feeling? Right. You're growing your intuition to color. Yeah. Basically. So you don't have Definitely. to pull out your color wheel every time you do a painting and try like, what's yeah. the right answer here? You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I never understood the color wheel, but I'm very poorly yeah. trained in in the classical art stuff. Yeah, like, I never understood it, so I always yeah. just winged it in Photoshop. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I mean, color. I think like composition is very emotional, and it it yeah. could work. You, you could learn theories, and then you could just go in the complete opposite direction and make it work. Yeah. If, if Although I think color theory is very useful if you're like painting, right? Because you kind of need it to understand how paint will blend. But when you're working digitally, it's like anything goes. It's you can just go totally crazy with color. You can do anything. You know. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's based I on think. the same theories, but you can change yeah. it later, and you can. Right. You know, you don't have the same limitations in terms of like everything will turn brown on your canvas and then you have nowhere to go like you can okay, go back a couple steps for example or you can change right, you can experiment completely. more right on yeah. the surface while you're doing it instead of yeah. you know, put down paint you're like it's gonna take you a while to fix it instead of 
Yeah, because I've been there. Yeah, when I paint traditionally, it's a disaster, you know? The only technique that I've found to make it work is to really limit my color palette. Um, but otherwise, it's just, <laughs> right. that it's Well, disaster. that's how, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how it's traditionally taught with physical mediums is you start very limited because if you give them the full color palette it's too much they just they just get lost and it doesn't benefit them in learning color so yeah. you start very limited and you <laughs> yeah. get that intuition with a few directions that they can go in and then you slowly start to make it more challenging you know yeah modern. in general that's like a really wonderful tip for learning a new technique it's like to right. do it as simple as possible to start with and just try to get that down first right Digital, it's the same you don't want that frustration to just completely destroy your motivation and then yeah i'm still traumatized <laughs> by that kind of purpley brown color that came out of like blending acrylics in high school like when i see it now i'm like oh <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, i know exactly what you're talking about because <laughs> they have well the problem is that the high schools they buy the same like three colors right and yeah they'll, they'll mix they one like is more too powerful. much blue and red and then you get this color and it's like yeah. yeah once you get a, or like you start heading towards the dark they'll all just they just funnel into that brown and purple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i know which stuff. but if you have good quality acrylics like i don't think that's yeah problem. That's problem. i'm trying i'm trying to learn it like I've, I've bought some good paint a gouache works really well for me actually better than acrylic but um I'm, I'm getting there but it's with with digital art i feel very free with the colors i feel like nothing can stop me and with painting i'm like this could go horribly wrong at any minute. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. What's the next one here? Um. <laughs> Somebody in the YouTube chat said, I can remember the smell of that color. <laughs> <laughs> of the color. As soon as you mix it, it's like, oh. It's like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny. Um. So what fundamental concepts do you need to get better at to begin to use reference images as guides? Um, it's kind of a long question. Do you want me to read the, the, all the context here? Yeah. It's, okay. Right now I can mimic repaint another artist's painting or I can paint the reference photo exactly. But the moment I try using only reference images and doing my own stylization to it, everything falls apart. Colors are dull. Anatomy is wonky. Composition is boring. Lighting is predictable. Flow of the piece is flat. Overall, it creates a very flat and not dynamic piece that is clunky. So I guess I guess the problem here is that like a doing a, a master study of a painting is like it's already been solved for you. The master has already stylized it and made it work, simplified some things, took things out of the reference. But then if you just have a photo, it's like the dirty, organic, natural, everything. You get all the detail. So how do you learn, I guess, to, to do that? <laughs> yeah. Very big question here. Well, OK. <laughs> I think, first of all, I think we already touched on some of the stuff that is like a good answer to this. So we yeah, can yeah. give a more compact answer. But like, I think this is a case of somebody trying to take on too much in one go. Like trying to say like, okay, I'm going to draw my stylized version from this reference image and I'm going to completely nail it. I'm going to get everything right. I'm going to get color, pose, composition, form, everything right. And then they see the end result and they're like, oh, I didn't nail it. And, it, and it's like, well, of course, you because you set the standards so extremely high and created an, an unattainable goal. I do think, you know, you've got people who are like really big. I don't know how you are about this, but you got people who are like really big on studying reference all the time, right? Uh, studying reference artists, like looking at the uh, master, doing master yeah. studies. Yeah. But I think that if you do that too much, you might be kind of like setting yourself up for really bad imposter syndrome because you're like constantly looking at the art of people who have like made this incredible sort of like process in their career and have figured out how to master what they do. And then you're going to like fall short of that when you do your own version. So like psychologically, you're setting yourself up for like disappointment in yourself because you've said like, I want to, I need to be on the level of this master that I've studied, which I think is like, some people are enormously motivated by doing master studies, but some people will do that and then feel awful about themselves. And I wonder right. how, how good is it for your artistic practice if you're 
kind of like, you know, comparing yourself to these masters. So I think that that's where it needs to stop. Like, don't compare yourself so much to the masters. Look more at like, what can you do? And then make the goal that you're trying to reach attainable. So like, stop saying like, now I'm going to make my wonderful version of this reference photo no choose a focus like what we said earlier like mm -hmm. be like what are you oh, studying from this person at the moment yeah be like okay yeah. i'm gonna use this reference image and make a stylized version and i'm gonna focus on lighting you know only the lighting and that's an attainable goal and don't bring in i think if you're somebody that gets very demotivated from doing master studies don't bring in all of these like masters who do it really well as your reference before starting, like put that away for a bit and just allow yourself to sit with your own skill set, and, and don't bring in the chaos of like the mental chaos that comparing yourself to others brings. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would recommend. That's like a, I don't know what you would recommend in that situation. Um, I would say that the, the question here really is like, how do I get good? <laughs> right? Yeah. Which is just, it's like, well, it's, it's every, it's all of the stuff. It's all the stuff that we always talk about you know and because when you're looking at a painting from a master from somebody who's been doing it for a long time it's just a combination of all these good decisions that they're making from all the skills that they've learned they're not copying their photo they're changing it based on all the information they know and then when you copy their their painting you're copying the solution it's like or you're copying their solution. Yeah. It's not, it's not the solution. It's their yeah. solution, but it is a solution that works. Um, and so you're not doing any actual thinking here. You're just, you're copying a solution. And so the, the way to be able to do that on your own is through a lot of practice, a lot of experience. It, it's, there's no quick answer here. It's, it's to really think about like, why do these artists that you're copying, why are they able to do it? You know, it's, well, it's because they've gotten good. They know how to solve these problems. And it's, it's, it's frustrating to know that, <laughs> but the path there is to slow improvements over time. Yeah. And so the exercise that I would recommend, if you're gonna study from masters, like if you, if you think you have the personality type um, where you're okay studying from masters and using it in a positive way, um what you do is you you could do a study from a master focus in on one thing you're trying to learn from them and then put it away get your own reference photo and apply what you just learned from that master in your own way so you're yeah. you're not just copying and then boom there's there's my end result i got a good painting because i just copied a solution but like you learn something from by copying it yeah. and then you apply it by now trying to solve a similar problem by seeing yeah. someone solve one of those problems. Yeah, I think that's really spot on because that's taking it to the deeper level, right? That's like saying like, oh, it's not just what they did, but like trying to understand like what was the solution that this artist used and how could I also find a solution in my own way? And I think right. it's really important to not only like have these inspirations that you learn from, but to understand like what is it about these inspirations that inspire me? So like what is it about this artist that I like and try to find that deeper level, not just like, Oh, it looks good, but be like, I like the textures because the textures give life. How can I use textures get, to give life to my art, for example. And that's something that I talk about in, um, to bring it back to my book. Um, and in my exercise booklet that you can buy with the book, it has worksheets in the beginning that are focused on this, like kind of brainstorming what inspires you and then trying to break that down into like, why does it inspire me? Like, what are the specific things that I like about it? And then how can I implement that into my own artistic practice? Because I think it's really important to go that deeper level. As an artist, you're just like, you know, it's natural for us to compare ourselves to the people we look up to, but then we could also, sometimes we get kind of superficial about that, just thinking like, oh, they do it well, but not like kind of digging deeper, like why do they do it well? And also I think, when you're looking at artists and thinking like they have better solutions for stylization and I don't, that like you kind of overlook that like that artist that you may be studying doesn't feel that way about their own work, right? Yeah. Like I feel like even these great masters are still like often frustrated in their own creative process because they're like also trying to learn and also trying to push themselves in their own way. So like no artist is ever gonna reach a point, I think where they look at their own art and they're like, yes, 
I have nailed this. <laughs> I have figured yeah. it out. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's when like you stop in, growing. Yeah, it's like You're inherent like, to your creative process to constantly be like, no, I need more. I need to learn to be better. You know, so um, like learn to sit with that feeling of frustration about your work too, because like every artist has it. <laughs> every artist love the pain yeah <laughs> deal with it art is suffering <laughs> that's yeah. my answer deal with it <laughs> yeah. you know, you have no choice really you're gonna have yeah. to um let's see here uh, style consistency advice on style consistency oh, yeah. is that a do you have to have a consistent style? I, mean, yeah, I guess I it, it can help in a career for sure, right? right? Yeah, there's like different spectrums because, or there is, a, it is a spectrum because, um, you know, you have like some fields of concept art, for example, where style consistency is like non-existent. Like you have to adapt to different styles in your To work. the project. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll have like a style lead on the project and you have yeah. to follow. Exactly. Yeah. And then on the other side of that spectrum is like social media where like you could literally post the same picture every day and like gain a following from that because like some platforms favor consistency. So, and I think a lot of people <laughs> think that consistency is necessary because some platforms favor consistency and people yeah. are very successful with that in terms of follower numbers, but that says nothing about, um, yeah, you know, how their career, career really looks. Yeah. It's like, you got to remember your career is going to be like, you know, five, six decades. And if you build your career on based on the Instagram algorithm. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the platform kind of, I was talking about. It's yeah. like, <laughs> like why base it on a good solid foundation of who you're going to be as an artist and, and, and then use Instagram as a tool as best as you can, but don't base your career off of one social network platform and how they do things. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I feel, yeah. I believe that that's kind of where those issues started to pop up. Like that's where I started to hear more about style consistency, how important that yeah. is as, as more and more artists sort of had an identifiable brand for themselves on social media and other artists see that and they're like, Oh, should I have that too? And I guess if you're, you know, if that's what you want to go for, then yeah, style consistency can, can be important. Um, but I do find it limiting, you know, sometimes I think like yeah. if you, if you force style consistency on yourself, um, like if you force it, then you may be limiting your creativity enormously. I also think that a lot of people who think that they have multiple styles, they think that they have an inconsistent style. They usually don't. They, if you, if somebody else looks at it, they can see consistency where you can't, right? People are often blind to their own, um, to how much their work is consistent is part of a whole. So I think before deciding that you have an inconsistent style, it's important to like talk that through with other artists and get some feedback on that to make sure that you're like, is this something that you think is the case or is it really the case? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you're somebody that loves to try different things, you should really, really cherish that and, yeah. and build on that and hold on to it. Um, because if, if you get rid of that, you're gonna kill a part of your creativity and you'll, you'll, you'll lose the, the joy of drawing after a while. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first time I saw that, or I, I heard of that issue was actually, it was pre social media. It, so it, it did kind of exist before that as well. Like in the gallery world. Um, oh yeah. In, yeah. That's where you, you have that a lot too. Yeah. Cause it's like, you'll build a follow a collector base with the or you'll be part of a gallery that kind of tends to have a style and you try to just like fit into that but like the the further you get in your career the more you you grow your collectors that expect a certain look from you and they'll keep buying because they like what you're doing and if you go too far away from that you you might not get those buyers to buy from you anymore because they're looking for a specific thing um so it's like yeah it it's a risk to go away from that. But if you really are like a really good artist, you, you can change your style and find a new collector base. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible or, or it's too hard to, to handle. Um, I mean, like, you know, you look at someone like Morgan Weisling who did movie posters for a while and had a very like illustrative look for like, you know, traditional movie posters from like nineties and stuff. And then he just decided he's going to do fine art. And then overnight he became a successful, not overnight, but like 
his first one man show, he sold out in a gallery with fine art paintings, very Western traditional type stuff. And it was like, well, it's because he was a good artist. He can, uh, he can change his style to what something new that he wants to do and find that new audience. And it's like today that's even easier to do with social media because if you switch in your account as different all of a sudden you might get that temporary like drop because your existing followers don't like it as much but then like you'll hit a new niche and they'll start liking it and you'll grow back to it um so i think it's a, you you got to just be brave and it's like if you really want to change your style just you got to do it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like as well, I feel like, um, authenticity is really important as well. Yeah. Right. It's like, I think some people come to a certain artist because they've come to expect a certain type of art and they just want to see a lot of that type of art. And if you move on from that, then they'll, you'll lose that audience. Right. But more people want to see who you are. A lot of people are just trying to get a sense of who somebody is, you know, by following their work and mm -hmm. the more kind of different interests that you have and styles and abilities that you have that you can like share the more you're giving a full three-dimensional picture of who you are as an artist and people can get an authentic sense of like the scope of your skills you know so i'm a big believer in embracing multiple styles if that's what you have and just seeing how you can make that work there's plenty of career paths for people with multiple styles um, and to not like conflate social media really with success. You know what I mean? Cause there's a lot of artists who do multiple styles who are doing like really good in various studios and working as concept artists. Um, but if you do want style consistency, I think then it's good to get some feedback from people and um, sort of ha have people that you trust kind of look at your work and say what kind of consistent themes they can see in your work so that you can kind of, contextualize because sometimes we think that you know artists overestimate how varied their styles are and then maybe it will help to like sort of see the themes and the recurring things in your work so you can build on that more and then you can build towards a more consistent style that is like authentic you know to what your interests are yeah so that's how i would approach that cool um how do you wait wait what was oh there how can you leave paint strokes in your painting without it looking messy or weird <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I'm lazy. So no, I'm not, not necessarily lazy, but like, I just lose, uh, you know, my attention span after a while and I'll just stop finalizing something and then I'll be like, well, I have to move on or whatever, or run out of time. That's how I choose what to keep kind of messy there. Um, mm -hmm. but usually like, I feel like if you overthink your drawing process, something's going to look weird to you. But if you just focus on what you want to get done and then leave the rest, then uh, usually like, and you don't look too much at your own art, like which details are correct, which ones aren't, but you just kind of step back and, and ask yourself like, oh, does this overall drawing work? Then um, that's, how I, that's how I base it. Um, so then I usually find that, you know, if I step back at my drawing and I'm like, well, the parts that I want to work, do they work? Um, then I can just let it go. And usually there's a bunch of messy brush strokes there that could look weird if I overanalyze it, but tend not to bother me. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that like with brush strokes to look good, it's, it's all about confidence and, and committing to a stroke because if you leave strokes that are that kind of scream that you're unsure of what you're doing. Um, that's when the brush strokes just don't look good. But if you do a confident stroke and you commit to it and you just like put it down, even if you put it in the wrong place, it's the wrong value, wrong color, but it looks confident, like the stroke itself will still look good. Yeah. Right. And you can fix the value of it later with like another stroke on top of it. That's also confident. But like if you're constantly building your painting or drawing with layers of uh, of, un you know, uncommitted line work or shapes, you're just going to be layering on top of a mess. And it, it it's always good to just like every step of the way, just be confident, even if it's wrong. Yeah. Um, like wrong, meaning like you'll end up changing it later or it's not where you actually want it to be. 
Yeah. yeah. I think having some messiness is like a requirement for art to look like vibrant and alive. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, right. some people can pull off a clean style very well. So, um, but, but I, I always leave some roughness in my work because I feel right, like without that. Right, but it's like you that, commit to that messiness. It's not like yeah. you're, it's, it, it, I don't know how to explain it. Um, for me, again, it's a question of focus though, you know, cause it's sort of like, um, it's like if you, it's a, like that painter that you mentioned before, what's his name, Nikolai? Um, Fashion. Fashion, mm -hmm. who has like roughness and then there's an area of focus and that mm -hmm. kind of stands out and the roughness has yeah. a totally new context when set against this one area, this face or something that kind of brings it all into focus. So for me, like I start very messy and then I will find my area of focus and kind of try to like make that work. And then I'll look at the messy stuff again once that area has been sort of elevated and then it tends to look different. So something that looked really chaotic before and didn't make sense, like falls into place when certain other elements of the drawing become more, um, how do you say, intentional. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I'm doing here with this study as well, um, because the rough sketch lines are still there. Like uh, some of the construction lines are there and there's some messiness, but it's okay because my area of focus is clearly her face. And and once that works and the rest becomes less important. And then I reach a point where I'm like, oh, I can just leave that. It's actually not that important. Right. But even your your parts that you're considering messy, I, I see that as um, still confident. Like, yeah. you weren't questioning yourself in that. You were more exploring and you are okay with putting something down in the wrong spot. And it totally shows in your strokes. Your strokes are very dynamic and, like, each stroke is attractive. Like, it, it's, it's a mess that looks good. And there's a difference when somebody's really unsure and it's kind of like chicken scratch, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. and that's a different type of mess. Um, yeah, that's that's why for me it's really important to start like super simple and light and quick mm -hmm. and move forward fast because then it it kind of like the more time I spend on something, the higher the chance is that that kind of like hesitancy will come into my workflow. So I try to stay ahead of it, always yeah. running ahead of it. <laughs> like a really good example is right under the jaw, like in that shadow shape you have in that draw on the painting right now. Like you have that shadow shape and then you have like four or five strokes kind of going across it and they're very quickly just kind of like thrown in there. And you can consider that messy, but it like it looks good. Like it looks like you meant to do that, right? Like it's not like you tried to keep it clean. I mean, one of your strokes goes well beyond the edge of the neck. And it's like if you were trying to be perfect and precise with it, you would have not done that. Yeah. But you were confident and the confidence allowed you to just kind of like pull through yeah. too far and you left it in. You didn't fiddle with it and try to like, oh, I'm going to yeah. erase it. Yeah. And the confidence comes a lot from just thinking like, oh, this is nothing. This doesn't matter. I'll throw it away. Exactly. If it exactly. And that, that's what helps me. It's not thinking like, wow, I'm so confident. This line is very confident. No, I just think like, <laughs> I just think like, I can just throw this away. I can, I can erase it. It doesn't matter. This is nothing. Um, so I think, right. yeah, that's, that's what works for no me. And if you're like an insecure artist like me, then it's good to just like, kind of try to um, like, tone down the insecure thoughts by just letting myself make mistakes or whatever. Yeah. That's why digital works really well for me too. Like you can literally just destroy the evidence of your drawing session really easily. Just press delete. <laughs> well, you've learned to hide the insecurity because I don't see any of that in your strokes at all. They, they look very confident. So, <laughs> so <Thank you. laughs> yeah. So do that for whoever's asking. <laughs> Do it lower step. Just set the bar really low for yourself. Be fine. Be yeah, and then you'd be like, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> Just be like, I will draw one line. And then you draw it and you're like, like I achieved oh. the goal. And that confidence will fuel you. Yeah. <laughs> um, how much time is left in this demo uh, that we're playing here? I don't know. Um, how, how long. It's about like an hour and 35 minutes, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you started and we playing start it a couple minutes, minutes in. So 45. So. Okay, so we yeah. got about 25 minutes probably. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, uh, how do you make studies fun? How do I make uh, studies fun? Yeah. I mean, studies are fun by nature. I don't know. <laughs> to me, they are. Yeah, how do you make studies fun? 
I just do studies. They're fun. <laughs> They're just fun to do. I don't know. Great advice. Uh, um, uh, drawing painting me, is fun. <laughs> I try to like intuitively choose what I feel like studying on that day. That helps a lot. So I just like recently I was like, I want to do some animal studies. And I don't know what. And then I just kind of Googled like weird animals or like lesser known animals. And I found this animal called the art wolf, which is like a kind of what? the art. I'm pronouncing it like Dutch people would. Art, uh, okay. But it, I think it art, art like art wolf, art wolf. like okay. art bark, but then <laughs> art wolf. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that. Um, and it's like, it looks like a hyena, but it's like more like a dog. And I found okay. a photo on Google of, of the puppies and it was so ridiculously cute. Like just the cutest <laughs> baby animal you could imagine. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm drawing these. Yeah. And that made it really fun. So yeah. that kind of stuff, you know, like choose like what you study, make it something you just enjoy drawing. Like yeah. don't see it as like a huge obligation, like a miserable slog, and that you have to come out of it with like your best art ever. Like allow yourself to have some fun doing it, I guess. Yeah, I, can I change my answer? <laughs> yeah, what's I realize, your answer? So I realize the, the reason it's fun for me is because um, I've always just kind of naturally just done what I want to do. It, if, if somebody tells me to do something yeah. and I don't want to do it, I just don't do it. So that's why naturally for me, just things I do are fun for me. But So like I've noticed in, with students that they get into – they're trying to be disciplined because this is like a good thing when you're studying is discipline. And so then yeah. they go online, they look for all these exercises that everybody's recommending. And that's all they do is like they study and they do these exercises and they're just always doing homework. Right. Yeah. And then they never make time to just like play and do things for themselves. And that's yeah. where really most of the learning comes from actually, because that's when you apply things apply the information you're learning to real projects that you're inspired by. And th those are the things that will stick in your head when you're yes. fully engaged and you love it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it will be like, it will say something about how you see the world. Like if you can portray what you like to see, then you're showing your vision to the world. You know, you're, you're showing people what you like and, and your art will be better for it. Um, Cause you don't, I know the feeling of like stumbling upon an artist on Instagram who like, you know, like I find new art on social media and it's like an artist who does like, who loves to draw like sunsets, you know, but they do it so well because they just love it. You know, right. they love it. And, or like artists who draw cars, but they draw them so well, you know, like it doesn't even, I don't even need to share that interest to see the joy that they have in what they're drawing because they love that thing. So I think it's important to know what you love to see and use yeah. that as a basis for your studies. That's what I try to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I try to like, or for example, like I try to go outside of my comfort zone sometimes because I did draw like some car studies a couple months ago because I just can't draw them. I'm terrible mm -hmm. at anything that has straight lines and like is supposed mm -hmm. to be like perspective look heavy <laughs> and solid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I always say that. Stuff. Yeah. I always say that everything, whenever I try to draw something with perspective and straight lines, it ends up looking like the cake version of it. Like, <laughs> like it's covered in fondant, you know, it's like got a right. slight bumpiness to it yeah. and the scale isn't quite right. So that's something I'm trying to learn. But then when I do decide yeah. to draw cars, even though it's like a chore, I, I just try to choose some that are interesting to me. So I chose like a bunch of old Dacias and Volkswagens and I thought that was Yeah. And then you stylize fun. and make them cartoony instead of yes. trying to make and them Yes. And stylize like them. Yeah. yeah. And everybody, I think it's really important as an artist that you connect with yourself every now and then and ask yourself, like, what do you like to do? Because as right. an artist, you can really lose touch with that because of what you said, because because of the homework. Right. You think yeah. that perspective is only about drawing it as these math diagrams when no, yeah. like the whole purpose of doing those is so you understand the rules and then you can bend them and use them in however way you want. You know, yeah. like, when you look at like all that, like Pixar um concept art where it's like environments and you got buildings and cars like they still look like they're in perspective like in the, they're in a 3d world yeah but they're totally not following you know all these rules of uh vanishing points stuff everything's kind of wonky but yeah it's because they 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 play with it yeah. they don't just follow things to the t um yeah, and people really put their own vision into it and that's that's where i think studies get really fun is if you 
tell yourself like, I'm not going to draw this to make a copy of it. I'm going to draw this to show people how I see this. Like, this is how I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about a balance. Those rules are very important. <laughs> yeah. I still haven't but nailed both. perspective yet, but it. I'll get there one day. Hopefully. <laughs> We're all on that path. <laughs> I don't know. There's a few people that really have nailed it. Yeah. But, yeah. I just don't, I, I'll never, I'll always stay in cake mode. I think cake versions cool. of things. <laughs> Cakes are cool. I like cake. <laughs> cake tastes good. It does. Yeah. It is tasty. Cake tastes better than like metal, you know? So yeah, that's true. I'd rather eat. A and cake that is the, car. that is the metric with which we must judge things. <laughs> well, how good, how good does it taste? taste? <laughs> That's right. That's why it's, yeah, just draw candy looking things all the time, right? Bright colors. Yeah. I say candy stuff. is a big inspiration for all my art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks delicious. <laughs> uh, how do you, how do you apply the anatomy in your drawing or when you sculpt with color? Oh yeah. Wait, what? Hold on. Sculpt with color. Yeah. Sculpt with color. That's something I mentioned earlier. Um, so Clearly, you were not listening. I'll explain it again. Um, you said sculpt with color? <laughs> yeah, I did. I'm just kidding, by the way. I'm just kidding. Um, but <laughs> well, I wasn't listening. I was probably reading the next question. <laughs> Sculpting with color. Right. Okay, so that's a technique that I, I call it that. Actually, like I can't take full credit for it because someone on DeviantArt once said that about my art when I explained yeah. my process. I don't remember who it was exactly, but somebody said, like, oh, it's like you're sculpting with color. And that really clicked with me. Um, it made total sense. So what I do is... I make like a rough version of my drawing and the rough version is like have my sketch and then the colors and maybe some shadows. And what's really important is that I, I change the color of the lines. Um, so I, I never work with desaturated lines. I always give them like a, like a reddish hue or like any color really. And then set it to multiply. And then you get like this nice interaction of the line layer on top of the base colors. You get all these new colors from that. So if you were to color pick, um, so you just kind of see that here, right? Like yeah. the sketch lines are sort of reddish, you can see. And then in all the different places where it blends with the color, with the layer below, you get all these different gradations of red and lighter colors and darker colors. And once you have that, you know, once I have that, I can flatten all of that into one layer and then just paint on top. Yeah. And the painting on top is like sculpting with color because I just kind of sculpt the shapes and the details out of what is in front of me. And I try to use the colors that are already on the canvas as much as possible so that the harmony of the color scheme is intact. Um, so you can see that here, like I'm basically shading, I'm, I'm adding like, you know, different kinds of volumes and shading and lighting just from what was already there when I merged the rough version. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's very like easy for me because I don't have to make a lot of creative decisions in terms of adding new colors or picking a new tool or whatever. I can just mm. pick a color and paint, pick a color and paint. And it feels like sculpting to me. Oh, um, so that's what sculpting with color is. And what was the full question? Um, or do you just go with the flow? I, I, I'm not really sure exactly what. It was anatomy, right? Did you, like how right. did you apply the anatomy into your drawing when you sculpted with color or did you go with the flow? So the, for oh, me, think, like okay. the anatomy is like, or like the construction is something that gets worked out in the sketch version, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's where the basic shapes go down and in, in the sketches. And I try to keep the basic shapes fairly simple because I, I just love the semi-realistic style. And the, the semi-realistic style is a lot about like simple shapes to start. And then as I'm detailing and rendering, it'll get more and more gain realistic qualities in the shading and in the, in the detailing um, on top of that sort of like simplified shape. And that's how you get like a mix of like realism and, and the more stylized quality of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so those basic shapes are in the sketch. But then when I'm sculpting with color, that's when I'm like refining it and trying to like kind of get those details right. And I will change stuff around if I need to, or like move stuff around or just paint over the whole thing if I feel like it needs changing. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually I stick to my initial sketch. So the initial sketch is really where like the sort of shapes and the anatomy come in. And then yeah. the details get built on top of that. 
Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so this is a question about your career. How, how involved were you in the design development of Alloy in Horizon Zero Dawn? And how did that gig come about? I don't know. If that... um, so I was like, honestly, not... Um, I was involved like at a crucial phase, but not for an extremely long amount of time. So I was on the project for like, I'd say four to five months, um, just coming up with variations and sort of looking at how she would look. Um, when I came into the project, Aloy basically already existed but in a different form and had gotten some feedback that was like, um, you know, that she was a bit too young and that she looked a bit too much like a princess and they wanted to like bring her up in age and make her more of a woman. So that's how I got involved. And, um, and I, I did a lot of work on like her, her hairstyle and like accessories and sort of stylistic elements that, gave her more of like a tactile quality, I guess. And, and a lot of those things, like I, I ended up sort of moving on to different work and then years later, the game came out. So there was a lot of work done on this character after I had left, but like elements of what I had worked on were integrated into the final design. You know, so I was not like in charge of her design in any way, but I did contribute some details that made it to the end. Um, and I think that it really helped that I was in it at a, at a crucial point where the character kind of transformed um, into a different type of character and they kind of stuck with that through to the end. Um, but in the end, they also ended up like scanning an actress's face for her face and, you know, translating it all into like photorealistic 3D. So there was a lot of like translation in that process. Um, what was the second part of the question? Oh, shoot. I've, uh, how did you get the gig? Oh, how did I get the gig? Yeah. Um, so I was, uh, really lucky because, um, somebody that followed my work was working at Guerrilla Games and he had overheard the art directors discussing that they were looking for a new artist to work on the design. So they they need they knew that they needed to change direction, and they were looking for somebody. And he was a uh, I believe in like working on the UI design, and he mentioned my name, and uh, and then he sent me a message, and he was like, I dropped your name here to the art director. Are you interested? And he like got us connected with one another, so they wouldn't have like I think found my work, and asked me to work on the project if this person didn't work at Guerrilla Games coincidentally at the time. So I'm super grateful to that person um, to that he connected us because uh, that was like a really great opportunity. And it was like a big thing in my career because I had been doing a lot of like casual games for children for a long time. And that this was the first time that I was working for like a more mature audience. And it was like a really natural fit. It was really great. And working with Guerrilla Games was awesome because they're located in the Netherlands too. And we don't have like huge game industry or like we do have a lot of casual games but we don't have like a, a big triple a game industry so it was like a really unique opportunity so i always think it's a very good example of like get your work out there in any way that you can because you never know who's gonna see it and remember it i think a lot of the work that i found was not necessarily from the art director stepping directly towards me it was because like somebody worked at the company that used to also be on deviant art for example like people who used to follow my work when they were teenagers are now working at like bigger companies for example and they like remember my name so i think it's really important to like always get your work out there in whatever way you can and just show it to people and you never know what's going to come out of it so that's the tip i can give and for the rest it's just a weirdly specific story that is difficult to translate to a wider experience yeah um somebody wants to know how you get such good hairstyles in your stuff in your work <laughs> <laughs> i just really love painting hair that's like one of my favorite okay. things to draw so do you look at a lot of hairstyles and just like you just you've just painted so much hair that like it just yeah you just kind of know it looks good now right 
Yeah. Well, I'm really inspired by the little mermaids, like my number oh, okay. one inspiration, I'd say, or like my number two. So what's I'm just always one? like, hmm? It's number two. So what's number one? Number one was, I mentioned that before. I guess you don't remember that either. Huh? Wait, wait, wait. Uh... <laughs> when you said Disney princesses and then you, oh, you said Powerpuff Girls. You get an F for this assignment. <laughs> it, it was Alphonse Mucha. Oh, oh, well, for hair or just in general? No, just in general. <laughs> Just in general, and um, the Little Mermaid is my second. Just in general, inspiration. Okay. Um, I think like all what of my What about Powerpuff is... Girls? You mentioned that. Well, Do that yeah, that is part face? of. That's one of my many inspirations. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I used to draw Powerpuff Girls as well. I used to like mix it up. I would draw like Powerpuff um, fan art of like other franchises. So I drew like a Powerpuff Girl Padme with like oh. you know from Episode Two Star Wars. And that's like one of the most cringy drawings that I ever made. And I ended up showing it to Ian McCaig and he was like, he didn't know what to do with it. It was just too weird. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so the Little Mermaid, I think all of my art is kind of like Little Mermaid tribute art in a way. Cause like almost everything I draw is like floaty and underwatery and big hair and just a kind of like femininity right. to it. Um, so that, flowy. Yeah. yeah, flowiness. So that always inspired how I draw how I draw hair. Cool. Uh, so many of these, I'm, I'm trying to scroll through these comments and it's like, most of them are about style. And I feel like we've covered so much of it. I don't want yeah, yeah. to, there's that's like okay. every single one of them or, or it's about like confidence and motivation or something. Mm -hmm. um, color again, how do you get better at color? At what age did you start um, drawing? <laughs> Do you want to answer those age? types of those yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. I started what drawing when I was really young, like ever since I can remember, like mm. ever since I can remember. And there's this one moment that I think is like a funny story about like my relationship with art. Because um, I was drawing in kindergarten when I was like four or five. And I was drawing this, this person and this just a person and everyone was like oh it's so good it's so good Lois and then what there's always like a brat you know like another I've, kid been, in the class. I've been calling you Lois because of your is, it's Lois yeah my, my real name is Lois my nickname is Lois okay so both are okay yeah both are fine okay <laughs> Okay. All right, your grade has been raised to a b minus and a, anyway so somebody there's always like a brat in the class who's like one leg is longer than the other and that was like their feedback um, on my drawing that I made when I was five. And I was like, that's because they're taking a step forward. It's perspective. And I, I just completely made that up on the spot. I, I didn't know, <laughs> like, I was just trying to defend my art. Right. And then, um, and then my teacher was like, wow, Lois, that's so beyond your age. You're so good. You know, perspective. <laughs> <laughs> it's perspective. So, um, yeah. that's like how I kind of like defended my art at the time. But I remember that like a lot of my relationship with art from a young age was um, um, was from like getting positive feedback from people, like hearing from people like, oh, you're good at this. So then I would do yeah. more, basically. Um, and I just I just felt like my talent, you know, so I would just spend a lot of time drawing and uh, and, and get good feedback from teachers and classmates and just from a super young age. So I think that that's kind of where it all came from, you know? And then when I was uh, like a teenager, I got really into drawing. That's sort of where my style came from and everything came together in a big mixture, you know? But at that time, you know, I was kind of like a miserable teenager. I was just one of those, you know, like I said before, just kind of like grumpy teenagers. And, um, and it was an escape for me, you know? So things like that kind of play a role. It's kind of interesting to see the psychology of like what inspires somebody to go into art. I think, I mean, do you know what inspired yeah. you to go into art? I, I think that, like, as a kid, that, that, uh, insp or not the inspiration, the encouragement that you get from adults is, like, the biggest thing. I mean, yeah. I, I also remember just, like, I, I think I stuck with art because I would get some of those key moments of encouragement, and that motivated me to keep going, and then if, if, if there wasn't one of them, I might have not kept going and not gotten better to get the next encouragement. 
and it's like i guess it's kind of like luck <laughs> it is though it is a lot of luck and that's why i think like positive feedback for young people with their art yeah. is really important and or whatever it is they're into even if they're struggling yeah just, like just encourage them to like don't give them too much real feedback because <laughs> that could yeah. just discourage them it's yeah there's like a time and place for everything right, right. and it's, it's really important to learn to enjoy what you love and mm -hmm. i was really lucky to yeah. you know, have those positive influences in my life at a young age. Having said that, though, there's a lot of people who get like really negative feedback and like a lack of support for their art, but still persist, which I find incredibly brave um, and like amazing that people do that. Um, yes, that's interesting. But it's like as long as you know that it's something you love, that's that's something yeah. really important. And I kind of knew that my whole life. So I didn't even think I would become an artist for my profession. I just knew that I enjoyed drawing. So spent a lot of time doing it. Yeah. When did you start doing it professionally? Um, well, when I was 18, I kind of needed to decide like what I was going to do with my life. And right. I, high school ends. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I, all of my classmates were like, you know, applying to colleges since <laughs> yeah, like yeah. 11th grade. And I was like, I think I'll just wait until like literally a couple days before high school ends. Because um, in the Netherlands, is, you can just sign up in the summer. And it's not really a big deal. Um, right. And I just like, I didn't think that being an artist was a viable option. I just thought artists like, you know, cut off their ear and like fade <laughs> into obscurity. Yeah, right. <laughs> I had a lot of negative stereotypes about artists, right. you know. I think that almost everybody gets. Um, and so I wasn't sure if I was going to do it. So I was thinking about like maybe studying like philosophy or history. Oh God! Um, solid career Cause, choices. Because that's the, yeah, that's a better <laughs> route. More chance of success there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was considering all this other stuff, and then in the end, I was like, I just don't think I can deal with this, the inner struggle of like um, not drawing when I want to draw. You know, like I just really wanted to draw, and I had to make time for other stuff, and I didn't like it. So I just decided to do animation because I was like, animation sounds like a job. Like if you're an animator, you are like a something. Whereas if you're like an artist, then I just picture like this cliche, you know, like, like a Frenchman with like a long cigarette and like a beret or something. I don't know. Weird stereotypes. I don't know if you grew up with the same stereotypes about art. Mm. No, not so much. Not really. No, I, no. I mean, I, I had some artists in my, in my life that I, I use as inspiration. I didn't mm -hmm. really study much history, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, I didn't know about like all the classical artists um, until I don't know, maybe high school, when I started being forced to learn it. Um, mm -hmm. But before that, when I was being mentored with with some artists, like it was just them. They were my influences, and I, you know, they, I had no stereotypes that I that I remember being negative. Well, having a mentor is really important, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I did have an art teacher things. who was really supportive of what I did. And mm -hmm. he, he actually like the first time I drew with a tablet was because he had ordered some tablets and let me use them first. So he was like super supportive and he was the one that suggested animation. And I think I was like really just waiting for an opportunity to study art. Like I wasn't sure if it was the right choice, mm -hmm. but I was just waiting for a sign. And he was like, how have you thought about animation? And I was like, yes, I'm going to do animation. And then I just instantly right. like, went and signed up for it. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> I was just like, that sounds great. Yeah. And I just went and did it. Yeah. Um, it kind of impulsive, but it was, it was a good choice in the end, you know, cause you learn so many different skills in animation that you can use in, in a variety of different ways. Yeah. You just draw a lot of frames. <laughs> It'll be a lot of drawing. Yeah, a lot of frames. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you did traditional animation, right? That's where. Yeah. Was, yeah. OK. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's it was like um, I think if you studied animation in the US, it would be a different story because a lot of those schools are like kind of connected to studios. So you could like you get like you learn how to work in a studio setting. But in the Netherlands, we don't really have that much of an animation industry at all. We have like most anim animators are freelancers who just have like small businesses and do mm. freelance work. So you kind of learn how to like come up with your own ideas and direct your own projects and kind of do everything like, do the, cool. you know, the backgrounds, the character, everything. So 
the, yeah. the kind of like stuff coming out of that school was fairly amateuristic because it's not really realistic to expect every animator to be able to do everything on their own. But you did learn to, to be kind of like an all rounder in the creative process, which was beneficial for me. Okay, cool. Um, so as a person who's not good at traditional drawing, but wants to get into digital, do you recommend working more traditional before shifting over? This is like a very popular question. What's your take on it? <laughs> I went straight into digital. Like I learned oh, really? all of my drawing skills in digital, in the digital setting. You, when um, you were studying animation, it was it was digital. Uh, yeah, most of it. Oh, yeah. okay, but it we wasn't three D. We did have 3D. like drawing. It we was... had like two D drawing class. Like we had model drawing and stuff, but. Mm -hmm. Dutch, Dutch were... education is incredibly informal and so uh -huh. it was, I don't know, it wasn't like really like a proper training in that sense. Um, no, I, I've learned everything. I learned everything about color, everything about sketching and drawing and construction and all of that digitally. Cool. And now I'm trying to translate those digital skills kind of into traditional skills more. So I'm, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm trying to paint. That? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's I'm actually really surprised. Direction. Yeah. When I, I'm really surprised when I draw, um, when I paint, um, that a lot of what I've learned in the digital setting can be translated into mm -hmm. traditional. But it is like a kind of, there's a bit of a learning curve there. It's an so annoying it's like, struggle. It's the point yeah. where you like, you know, a lot of what you're supposed to do, but your hand is used to one thing and it's not doing yeah. what is like, the materials are just acting differently. So it's annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so like a little bit of a adapt. bump you have to get over. Right. Yeah. And it feels for me like the thing about drawing digitally is like, all right, here's the end of the demo. So I've reached the end of the drawing demo. And this is the part where I scrawl in black letters now on Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And again, the rem the reminder to, to myself to bring up the book. Um, it is yeah the but link yeah. is in the lesson notes of parker.com slash lowish live the link the url you see there you go to there click on lesson notes and there's a link to the kickstarter where you could buy the book yeah and there's a ton in the book about finding styles tips for people who feel like they have too many styles or tips for people who feel like they are not flexible in their style there's exercise ideas and you can also through the kickstarter get a um exercise booklet with like worksheets in there to help you reflect on your inspirations and your goals and also different kind of like sketching um, exercises that you can do to kind of like learn about what you gravitate towards. So the exercise that I did with, um, you know, one more angular and one more soft is like a kind of exercise you can do. And then once you've done it, you can ask yourself like what felt more natural to me? Like what, what did I gravitate towards and what connected with what I'm fascinated with? And it'll teach you something about your own kind of like, you know, um, interests artistically and help you kind of cultivate your own voice. Nice. Um, but yeah, back to the question about the traditional stuff. Yeah, it's like, I'm, I think that you can learn to draw in the, digitally or traditionally and just know that like at some point you may have to like translate those skills to the other side because I have like a friend who does almost all traditional art and now she's doing more concept artwork and it's sort of like she has to end up doing some of the stuff digitally because it's more practical for concept art and it is like quite kind of a steep learning curve when you switch to the other medium but it is possible do you agree yeah. on that yeah absolutely I, I just see these things as tools like it these aren't uh, like you can transfer pretty much all of it over all that information about composition, shape, color, style, perspective, anatomy, like all the stuff you're, you spend most of your time learning as a student is transferable to any medium. And everybody focuses on traditional versus digital, but it's like the same problem if you're doing, you know, if you're used to doing oil painting, and then you're, you're like, I want to try watercolor. It's like, well, that's the same problem. You have to figure out this new medium. And it's annoying because it's not acting the way oil paints act. The, you know, the surface is going to be different. And it just like drips. And now you have to have a different process because you can't just like 
blend wet into wet paint or whatever it is. It's like, it's a new tool that you're using. You have to learn the tool, but all the other stuff is it's the same. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's the same basic skills. And actually, you know, if you feel like you have a really high degree of control in one medium, it might be really good for your skills to try and like move to a medium where you have less absolutely. control. Because absolutely. a lot of that work ends up being more interesting uh, also for others to look at because there's more of like a thought process to it. Whereas the medium in which you feel you have the most control, it can kind of lose its shine as well because you're not like, you know, solving problems as much as you would in a, yeah. in a different medium, which is why I like to try you know, painting like once a year and then I feel like I've really challenged myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that it'll always be really frustrating in the beginning because you'll yeah. have more, more problems than successes when you first start that new tool. But like, if you kind of battle through it, like just get through that initial period, you're going to learn stuff from that new medium that you can actually bring over to the, to the old ones. And the more versatile you are, like just the more tools you have in your tool bag that you can go to as an yeah. artist to be creative in whatever you do. Like who knows 20 years from now what project you're going to be on. And if you're able to use the advantages of one medium for whatever it yeah. is, because it's faster to do something or because you can get a certain look with it, like you just pull that tool out when you need it. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. And you learn a lot about yourself, I think, as well from trying out different media. Because you just, you find out like where your strengths lie. I kind of found that out when I was trying. Last year, I, I instead of Inktober, I did sort of like a painting challenge where I tried like a different medium to paint with every week um, in October. And I, I kind of learned like, I kind of discovered that like, um, that I can get like some personality in my brush strokes when I paint. Like that happens naturally. And I struggle with the colors. I struggle with getting the details right and having that level of control. But the the brush strokes that worked for me, you know. And then I learned something about my own style that that's something for me to lean into and build on. Mm -hmm. um, which is why I think it's really good to always try new things. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's about it. Yeah. Uh, is there anything we didn't ask that you? wanted us to ask <laughs> yeah you didn't even ask if my book was on kickstarter it's on kickstarter <laughs> what? wait what you have a book <laughs> what book <laughs> yeah oh geez Dan. oh the one on screen right <laughs> yeah the one over there <laughs> yeah the of style low. of lowish so anyway check out my okay. kickstarter because it's only a couple days more and it's like the last opportunity to get the book with the free stretch goal goodies and some of the additional add-ons which includes the exercise booklet so i've got that over here on the left side the exercise booklet has tons of exercise ideas for artists to do. And I think a lot of the stuff we talked about during this stream, like I, I, tr I resisted the urge to, for every question to answer. There's an exercise about that. In the <laughs> oh, exercise yeah, I know. <laughs> but there is like, I have a lot of like different kind of like ways to reflect and try out drawing exercises to learn stuff about your style and build your skills in there. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, you can get it through the Kickstarter, but only as long as the Kickstarter is active, which is until next Wednesday. And after that, it's gone and over. Yeah, it's funny. I had the same urge or at this point, like <laughs> I have I have a podcast. Yeah, Marshall called Draftsman, and like every time someone asks a question, I'm like, we have an episode on that. <laughs> oh yeah, so I have that now with like, my Patreon as well because right. I have like I've made 16 tutorials on Patreon, and most of them are about the most common questions that I get. So like, <laughs> right. How do I choose right. colors, and how do I? Yeah. yeah. So that's that's another thing. Like, I'm not here to promote my Patreon, but that is an option. Um, but I I just love it that you know, there are these common questions, but to me, they never get boring to talk about because it is like these things that um, like a lot of people struggle with. And I think any artist will continue to struggle with it at many points. So yeah, I've got a ton of resources on all of it and I'm always happy to talk about it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks looks, for having me. Yeah. I mean, I hope your book does well. It's already doing very well so <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> congratulations yeah, we're really happy with where we're at the only reason we're still uh putting a lot of work into promoting it is to make sure nobody misses out on the special kickstarter edition right yeah cool well yeah thank you very much um yes, john i think we're thanks. done you can end it whenever but <laughs> <laughs>